the daisy. Now listen. In the country, close by the high road, stood a farmhouse. Perhaps you have passed by and seen it yourself. There was a little flower garden with painted wooden pickets in front of it. Close by was a ditch. On its fresh green bank grew a little daisy. The sun shined as warmly and brightly upon it as on the magnificent garden flowers, and therefore it thrived well. One morning it had quite opened, and its little snow-white petals stood around the yellow center, like the rays of the sun. It did not mind that nobody saw it in the grass, and that it was a poor despised flower. On the contrary, it was quite happy, and turned towards the sun, looking upward and listening to the song of the lark high up in the air. The little daisy was as happy as if the day had been a great holiday, but it was only Monday. All the children were at school, and while they were sitting on the forms and learning their lessons, it sat on its thin green stalk and learned from the sun and from its surroundings how kind God is. And it rejoiced that the song of the little lark expressed so sweetly and distinctly its own feelings. Now, so far, this is really pretty. With a sort of reverence, the daisy looked up to the bird that could fly and sing, but it did not feel envious. I can see and hear, it thought. The sun shines upon me and the forest kisses me. How rich I am! In the garden close by grew many large and magnificent flowers. And strange to say, the less fragrance they had, the haughtier and prouder they were. The peon pe peonies? Po po ponies? Peons. Oh, peonies, peon. Ah, it is the first time I see the plural form of peon, or even see it as a written word. I have only ever heard it. All right, so. The peonies, if that is how you read it, puff themselves up in order to be larger than the roses. Uh, ah. <clears throat> to be larger than the roses were. Wait, oh, I completely messed up there. Okay, let's start at the, at the paragraph. I'm sorry, uh, I had the mouse cursor over the over the stream and it was bothering me. You know how it is. In the garden close by grew many large and magnificent flowers, and strange to say, the less fragrance they had, the haughtier and prouder they were. The peonies puffed themselves up in order to be larger than the roses, but size is not everything. The tulips had the finest colors, and they knew it well, too, for they were standing bolt upright like candles, that one might see them the better. In their pride they did not see the little daisy, which looked over to them and thought, How rich and beautiful they are! I am sure the pretty bird will fly down and call upon them. Thank God that I stand so near and can at least see all the splendor. And while the daisy was still thinking, the lark came flying down, crying tweet, but not to the peonies and tulips, no, into the grass to the poor daisy. Its joy was so great that it did not know what to think. The little bird hopped round it and sang, how beautifully soft the grass is, and what a lovely little flower with its golden heart and silver dress is growing here. The yellow center in the daisy did indeed look like gold, while the little petals shined as brightly as silver. I have to say, so far this is really, really pretty. The descriptions, the, the poetry of the comparisons used... Oops. Let's do this carefully. We do not want to mishandle the book. There we go. How happy the daisy was. No one has the least idea 
The bird kissed it with its beak, sang to it, and then rose again to the blue sky. It was certainly more than a quarter of an hour before the daisy recovered its senses. Half ashamed, yet glad at heart, it looked over to the other flowers in the garden. Surely they had witnessed its pleasure and the honor that had been done to it. Okay. <laughs> they understood its joy. But the tulips stood more stiffly than ever. Their faces were pointed and red because they were vexed. The peonies were sulky. It was well that they could not speak, otherwise they would have given the daisy a good lecture. The little flower could very well see that they were ill at ease and pity them sincerely. Shortly after this, a girl came into the garden with a large sharp knife. Oh, she went to the tulips and began cutting them off, one after another. Ugh, sighed the daisy, that is terrible, now they are done for. The girl carried the tulips away. The daisy was glad that it was outside and only a small flower. It felt very grateful. At sunset it folded its petals and fell asleep and dreamed all night of the sun and the little bird. On the following morning, when the flower once more stretched forth its tender petals like little arms, towards the air and light, the daisy recognized the bird's voice, but what it sang sounded so sad. Indeed, the poor bird had good reason to be sad, for it had been caught and put into a cage close by the open window. It sang of the happy days when it could merrily fly about, of fresh green corn in the fields, and of the time when it could soar almost up to the clouds. The poor lark was most unhappy as a prisoner in a cage. The little daisy would have liked so much to help it, but what could be done? Indeed, that was very difficult for such a small flower to find out. It entirely forgot how beautiful everything around it was, how warmly the sun was shining and how splendidly white its own petals were. It could only think of the poor captive bird, for which it could do nothing. Then two little boys came out of the garden. One of them had a large sharp knife, like that with which the girl had cut the tulips. And I lost myself there. They came straight towards the little daisy, which could not understand what they wanted. Here is a fine piece of turf for the lark, said one of the boys, and began to cut out a square around the daisy, so that it remained in the center of the grass. Pluck the flower off, said the other boy, and the daisy trembled for fear, for to be plucked off meant death to it and it wished so much to live, as it was to go with the square of turf into the poor captive lark's cage. No, let it stay, said the other boy, it looks so pretty. And so it stayed, and was brought into the lark's cage. The poor bird was lamenting its lost liberty and beating its wings against the wires, and the little daisy oops, could not speak of utter Ah, could not speak or utter a consoling word, much as it would have liked to do so. So the forenoon passed. I have no water, said the captive lark. They have all gone out and forgotten to give me anything to drink. My throat is dry and burning. I feel as if I had fire and ice within me, and the air is so oppressive. Alas, I must die and part with the warm sunshine, the fresh green meadows, and all the beauty that God has created. And it thrust its beak into the piece of grass to refresh itself a little. Then it noticed the little daisy, and nodded to it, and kissed it with its beak, and said, You must also fade in here, poor little flower. You and the piece of grass are all they have given me in exchange for the whole world which I enjoyed outside. 
Each little blade of grass shall be a green tree for me. Each of your white petals a fragrant flower. Alas! You only remind me of what I have lost. I wish I could console the poor lark, thought the daisy. It could not move one of its leaves, but the fragrance of its delicate petals streamed forth and was much stronger than such flowers usually have. The bird noticed it, although it was dying with thirst, and in its pain tore up the green blades of grass, but did not touch the flower. The evening came and nobody appeared to bring the poor bird a drop of water. It opened its beautiful wings and fluttered about in its anguish. A faint and mournful tweet, tweet was all it could utter. Then it bent its little head far towards the flower, and its heart broke for want and longing. The flower could not, as on the previous evening, fold up its petals and sleep. It drooped sorrowfully. The boys only came the next morning when they saw the dead bird. They began to cry bitterly, dug a nice grave for it, and adorned it with flowers. The bird's body was placed in a pretty red box. They wished to bury it with royal honors. While it was alive and sang, they forgot it and let it suffer. Want in the cage. Now they cried over it and covered it with flowers. The piece of turf with the little daisy in it was thrown out on the dusty highway. Nobody thought of the flower which had felt so much for the bird and had so greatly desired to comfort it. Oh, that's it. That is it. This is the next story that we'll read tomorrow. Wow, okay. That is abrupt. Huh. That is truly, truly sad. That is really sad. Holy moly, that is sad. Let me mark the next story and we will go to the discussion portion of this stream. So, the language, the language, the descriptive language of the flower's experience, of the daisy's experience, is so beautiful and so poetic that it really is absolutely tragic how this ends. There we go. I'll leave this here while I change the text. Um, what to think of it? This is a story, first point. This is a story that I would read again uh, a lot of times. Most of it really is about how well the flower's experience is described. And the bird as well and the whole world. And it's really nice to see the benevolent happiness and joy of the daisy and how it regards the world around her, it, uh, him, it, you know, um, how it thinks about the misfortunes, what it can't do, how it's all right with that, how it regards the fortunes that it can experience, the sunshine, the, the grass, the other flowers, the bird itself. I found, I found it so endearing. It is such, just such an endearing story. The way it describes the flower's happiness just because the bird danced around it and, and gave it some recognition. I found that so endearing. The da daisy is um, thinking, oh, the bird is going to go to the pretty flowers and give them all the attention. But the bird actually goes down to the daisy, gives the daisy attention, dances, shares in its happiness and beauty. And the daisy feels beautiful and feels so precious when it is just a daisy. That is ah, it's such an endearing story. In terms of the moral of the story, I do believe... Um, what I would take most from it, if I was telling it to a child, I would mostly focus on making them appreciate 
the mentality and the attitude of uh, gratitude, of being grateful for what you have and for what you can enjoy. The tulips, for example, they're described as being very pretty. But the last thing we, the last we hear of them, they are red with envy, they're upset, they're annoyed, and then they are cut from their roots, essentially killed. They lose their lives because the girl plucks them out, and that is it. The daisy, although in the end it suffered the same uh, fate, it did not squander or spend what time it had in the beautiful garden. It actually really, really enjoyed it every second. That is what I would focus on in terms of telling the child. But I believe what the writer wanted to tell with the story very clearly was that people should treat birds and flowers properly. Watch your children so that they don't go around killing <laughs> Killing life all willy-nilly that they understand. Um, I believe the, f the fact that the story uh, describes and points out that the kids killed the flowers and the birds and then they were super sad that they killed them. It, it is showing that sometimes we do not know how we are hurting other people, or other things. We don't know the damage that we are doing to these living beings around us that we have in overall supreme control over. I believe the story was more about that, was more about think about the flowers as people. I mean, uh, the flower would be awake in the night, not during the day, because in the night it's when it's breathing. Um, if you want it to be biologically accurate, I believe that is correct. Uh, I believe it is correct. But think about the flowers as people, think about animals as people in, in regards to the fact that they live and that they are meant to be in the wild and all around and stuff. I mean, I'm talking like I'm some kind of, <laughs> you know what, I don't, I don't think it's that cut and dry. Um, I believe it's okay to have pets and stuff, but you, you have to treat them right. I think it's the point of the story. The fact that, you know, you make the bird so, you capture a bird, you mistreat it, you, you just forget about it, and then you're sad that it dies. It's just such a kid thing to do, so watch your kid, watch your children. It is very, you know, the story, in terms of telling it to a, to a child, you are taking them through a journey, and possibly a very relatable one because maybe they have treated animals or plants in the, in this manner and so they can see the harm that they have done but if they haven't they will know in the future not to do so they will know that if they don't feed it water if they don't feed it food if they just cut plants uh, flowers apart they are killing these things and you need to teach the kids this and sometimes you know stories are the best way to to teach I believe this would be a story that would teach any child. Um, I'm sorry, I think I, I think I made something to the microphone. This is a story that would teach any child um, the, the importance of the life of animals and plants and how to treat them properly. And that if they don't want to be sad because they lost their pets or they lost their pretty flowers, that they need to treat them properly. Um, so... All in all, I really, really enjoyed this one. It's really pretty. The descriptions, the writing, the writing is really, really poetic and beautiful. Kind of maybe a cop-out to use that word, but I do believe, I do think, I do feel I'm smiling from ear to ear just thinking about this story. I will be reading this a lot. This is really pretty imagery and a really pretty story to tell children and to teach them. Again, I personally would focus more on the outlook of the daisy. I would focus more on that, but it doesn't hurt to remind a child uh, about the consequences of mistreating animals and plants and the value that they have in this world. Uh, that's going to be it. Thank you for listening. Um, 
I hope you will be here tomorrow for our next classic fairy tale. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear your thoughts. This is Cuscopia signing out. Take care. <laughs>